the central theme for the next few verses is something that's not very popular in our society today because it's about mutual subjection or submissive considerations. And no matter who you are, it's saying that we should be submissive in our spirit one to another. And it really comes to swallowing your pride and, and being willing to place yourself under the authority of another. To humble yourself and to say, I'm in subjection to someone else. Paul will go on to describe foundational institutions where this principle applies. So as he says this, he, he gives us those relationships. The relationship of a believer to the Holy Spirit. We're to be submissive to the Holy Spirit. The relationship of fellow believers. We're to be submissive one to another. Submit yourselves one to another. Humble yourself. The relationship of a wife to a husband. A wife is to be submissive to the authority of a husband. The relationship of a child to a parent. Children, obey your parents. And then it's going to go into a relationship of a servant to a master or to an employee to an employer. That you're to be submissive, you're to do what your employer tells you to do if they're paying you money. That makes sense, doesn't it? But all these relationships are coming up. And, and Paul is setting the stage saying, listen, you really want to be submissive to Christ? These relationships are ones you need to pay attention to. I'm not going to get to all of them tonight, but I will start with being filled with the Spirit. A relationship of a believer to the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, we've covered part of this. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 18, And be not drunk with wine, which we talked about, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So Paul is saying instead of being controlled by alcohol, the believer should be controlled and under the submission to the Holy Spirit of God. A few things we know about the Spirit. Uh, if a person has been born again and gave their heart to Jesus Christ and their spirit has been quickened, then they are indwelt with the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. What? Don't you know that the Holy Spirit resides within you? That Almighty God, the third person of the triune Godhead, lives inside you. Everywhere you go, you take him. Everything you see, he sees. Everything you hear, he hears. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, Paul again says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we should be taking on the wonderful characteristics of God because God lives inside a believer. Amen? God lives in you. Now, you're not God. That doesn't make you God, but God lives inside you because He indwells us. When the Holy Spirit is in us, He guides us. John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove or convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. John 16, 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and will show it unto you. Notice the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. If you will listen, it'll tell you what's right and wrong. You say that word and ping. That's the Holy Spirit saying, you know you shouldn't have said that. A Christian ought not be saying it. You wouldn't have said that if Jesus were standing here. That ugly thing you said to your wife, you know you shouldn't have said that. You need to go and apologize. And he'll tell you right from wrong if you'll just listen. Unfortunately, many of us grieve the Holy Spirit. When He tells us stuff, we ignore it because we're not going to submit to the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says we are to submit. Instead of being under the influence of alcohol, letting that affect it, we should be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He should be our commander-in-chief. 
Bible says the Holy Spirit will guide us in truth. Your best Bible teacher is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will never, ever contradict the Word of God. The Holy Spirit will open our eyes for what's coming. Eschatology, seeing events, not like the world sees them, but as God wants us to see them. We should look at the world events totally different than the way the rest of the world looks at it, because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The Holy Spirit points the glory toward Jesus. If you're working in the church or exercising a gift of the Spirit, it's not for your glory. It always points people toward Christ. If it's a gift of the Holy Spirit that you're exercising, it will always bring glory to Christ and not to yourself. It's not a ding, 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 look at me, look at me. It always points toward Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We are submissive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's good, isn't it? So that's one relationship. That's the best relationship. And we get that right, the other things begin to fall into place. So the second relationship is to be submissive one to another. Listen to Ephesians 5.15. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, this is not all the church members walking around going, Oh, you're better than me. Oh, no, no. Oh, you're better than me. Oh, no. I'm the worst of the worst. Everybody's better than... That's not what he's talking about. It's not of all of us going around going, well, what do you want me to do? I don't know. What do you want me to do? I mean, I, whatever you want me to do, I'll do because I'm submissive to you. I'll do what you... That, that's not what he's talking about. The perfect illustration is given in the previous verse in 519 where he says, speaking to yourselves, plural... In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, I think that what he's giving is a picture of the choir. Everyone singing in harmony with one another. The alto singing the alto part. The tenor singing the tenor part. The soprano singing the soprano part. And, and you've got the leader up there, the choir director, who's going... Now, how bad is it if everybody, when you go, when you go, that one person go, la, 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 and you go, you need to submit yourself to the authority of the choir director and to everybody else so that you can sing as a body of, because you're messing everybody else up. And that's what it means to submit yourselves one to another. Let's all get on the same page. Let's all look toward the same goal. What are we here for? We're not here to be entertained. We're here to see people come to Christ. We're here to preach the glorious gospel of the Word of God. The whole counsel of God. We're here to encourage one another and to provoke one another unto love and unto good works. We're here to bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. It's not about you. It's about Him. We need to all get on the same page. But if you have one person going, it's about me. It messes the rest of the choir up. I had a youth minister up in Mount Pleasant. Worst singer I've ever heard in my life. He would sing during vacation Bible school this song. Oh, won't you go to church with me? Oh, won't you come along? Well, sing sweet song and tell sweet story. Well, won't you come along? Tra-la. Oh, won't you come along? Tra-la. And you think, well, he's making it. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Ask Brother Billy. Ask Karen. Ask Nana. We, and, and you just sit there and go, I, I, that's the most nerve-wracking noise. But he didn't care. Wouldn't it be bad if you had a couple of choir members like that going, I'm going to sing the way I want to sing. I don't care what anybody says or not. And you're going, no, no, that's not the way a choir works. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it comes together like a team. When I played football, the coach would say on every play, everybody has a task. Everybody has a job to complete. On every play, no matter where the play's going, if it's going to the other side, you still got a task. You got to bump or lease and go downfield and look for somebody to knock their head off. 
Everybody's got that. If you wanted to sit around and watch go buy a ticket and a hot dog and sit in the stands, we don't have spectators on this team. You're either a participator or you're a spectator. If you're a spectator, go buy a ticket and get up in the stands. Everybody has something to do. Christianity is even more so. Everybody should be participating for the same goals. Everybody doing something. Not everybody doing the same thing, but everybody doing something and submitting ourselves to one another for the overall goal of where God's leading our church. That's good, isn't it? All right. The third relationship is the submission of the wife to the husband. And then we get to the fourth relationship. No, no. <laughs> I thought I'd skip it. I'm not going to skip it. I was going to get Brother Park to preach it, but he chickened out. He said, I got new member orientation. <laughs> Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, honestly, I'm going to be on these next few verses for a couple of weeks. I'm not going to finish this tonight. But this command gets a lot of press, I think, simply because it's, it's misunderstood. So I'm going to make several points about it. The first thought is, a wife is to be submissive to the authority of the husband because God said so. And that ought to be enough. Don't, don't fight. Don't argue with me or the church or anybody else. God said to do it. Amen. I mean, it's pretty plain. You go, well, did he really mean that? Yes, he really meant that. <laughs> Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands. At the end of the verse, I mean, at the end of that chapter, he says, and you should reverence your husband. You should honor him. And if you can't, don't marry the sapsucker. Amen? <laughs> God said to do it. If we're going to call God Lord, then we should trust and obey. God knows what he's talking about. The problem is, many of you gals, you married somebody that's not worth a hoot, worth following. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. He said, listen, okay, here's, here's a young lady that made a mistake and married a lost guy. How do you win him? Well, nag him to death. Just nag him, nag him, nag him. No, 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 that's not what the Bible said. It said that you should be in subjection to his authority in the home and that you will win him with your chaste conversation, with your behavior. What the Bible says. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. So in other words, in at least five different places in the New Testament, the Bible says, wives, submit yourselves to your husband. So it's not just one place, it's not taken out of context, it's said over and over and over again by multiple authors and not just the Apostle Paul. So God must have thought it was important for him to say it at least five different times. Second thing, a wife should follow her husband's leadership in the home because she's convinced that he is only seeking her very best good. So listen to the scripture again. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he, Christ, is the Savior of the body, which is the church. A Christian is submissive to the will of God because we know that God loves us and is only seeking our very best good. That's why we follow him, because he knows more than we do. And we're convinced he, he, he's telling me this because he wants the best for me. Unfortunately, many wives simply don't trust their husbands. And many husbands have not given their wives any reason to be trusted. Ultimately, a wife being submissive and respecting and honoring her husband is because she's being submissive and honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have this right, then you're not going to get this right. Long arm because he, he doesn't deserve it. He may not, but he does. And the Bible says if you're going to be right with him, then you need to be submissive and honoring in your attitude toward him if you're married to him. Ooh, you're quiet in here. <laughs> but husbands can make this obedience very easy or very difficult. Examples of where we go astray. So this should be fun. 
I think a lot of times it starts in the dating that a young man and a young lady go out and I'm assuming that they're Christians and the young man's going, come on, baby. Oh, baby. I'll respect you in the morning. Come on, baby. <laughs> Me and you, we're going to go all the way, baby. Me and you, let's go, let's go. And she's going, no, no, don't, don't, don't touch there. No, not yet. You need to quit. Oh, you're going too far. Uh, you know, oh, it's getting hot in here. Woo, I get, you know. And she's going, no, no. Now, uh, believe me, the roles can be reversed in today's society. And, and some of you moms, you better be protecting your sons because it's the girls going after them. But in my day, it was, come on, baby, come on, baby. And the girl was going, no, 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 better not. But what happens when you do this and finally, the girl goes, okay, okay, then we'll go all the way. You, you've, you've got a couple of things that have happened. Number one, in her mind, subconsciously, she's saying, you don't really love me. You're not seeking my very best good. You're asking me to do something that I'd be ashamed to go in and tell my parents. You're asking me to do something that you know is against my faith teaching in the Word of God, and you're asking me to do something that will break fellowship between me and God. You're not looking out for my best good. The truth of the matter is you don't love me, you love yourself. That's why you want to sleep with me. It's not that you're so in love with me. If you really love me, you'd want to protect my chasteness. You'd want to protect my integrity. You'd want to protect my reputation. But you're not. You're trying to push me to do something that I'm not comfortable doing. And that's not what a good leader does. The second thing that takes place is he forfeits that position of leadership. He should be the one setting the standard. He should be the one saying, we're not going past this point. No, we're not going all the way until the day we get married. No, I'm not going to take you to places that would make you feel uncomfortable. No, I'm not going to do things to you that you'd be ashamed to tell your mother or your father when you walk back in the house. He should be the leader, setting the standards. But that's oftentimes not what he does. The young man should be taking control of the relationship, but instead he forfeits that leadership role. It was her that decided how far they would go on a date. So they stand before me, Brother Sam, at marriage time, and I say, all right, Wives, you're to be submissive to the authority of the husband. He's king of the hill. And in her heart of hearts, she's going, I don't think so. <laughs> See, he gave that up, and I'm the king of the hill. And I'm going to, want to be the one to rule the roost because I don't trust him because he's not seeking my very best good. I cannot help but think about this. A marriage is much like the command of a ship. Every ship has a captain, and every ship has an executive officer. So you've got the XO and you've got the CO. Uh, the captain doesn't even have to be a captain. He can be a commander or lieutenant commander, but he's over the ship. He's the captain of the ship, and everybody calls him captain. And his XO is his right-hand man, okay? Just kind of giving you all a bit of Navy history type stuff. Uh, the captain does not lord over the XO, and the XO has recourse in case the captain outs outsteps his bounds. So the captain is not, I'm God, I can do whatever I want it, see. No, 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 if he goes too far, the XO has a, a course in which he, he can stop him. But most executive officers are very protective over their captains. See, if you're doing something wrong or if, or if you show any disrespect, the captain's not going to say anything. It'll be the XO that gets you. And, uh, or, or, you know, the chief petty officer. Now... Though there were many, many wonderful and talented, capable people that served in our commands, there was only one captain. Just one. And the family has a lot of great pieces, parts, but God ordained that there's one captain, and that captain is to be the husband. Which leads to point number three. A great husband takes the pressure off the wife. Amen. Say y'all, y'all say amen. Help me. It's lonely up here by myself. <laughs> Husbands need to prove to their wives that we want what's best for them. You can earn their respect through sacrificial living. 
By saying, I'll give up my wants to meet the needs of my family. I will earn their respect. I will earn their trust. I will show them I'm seeking what is very best for their family. We need to be willing to give our wife a reason to trust us, give them a reason to follow us, and then all the big responsibility is on the shoulders of the leader. Because God said, listen, wives, all you got to do is follow his leadership. So when you get to heaven, you go... And we hold the responsibility. And guys, let me tell you something. The Bible says one day we will be held accountable. We will stand before God and answer for what kind of spiritual leader we were. Did we share the word of God with our family? Did we pray over our wives? Did we pray over our children? Did we lead them to church and to worship? Not just on Sunday, but throughout the week and Always recognize the unseen presence of God at home. How did we lead? How did we captain the ship? Because when it pulls into port, God's coming for you. How did you do, sir? Well, I delegated that to my wife. That's fine. How did your family do? Because you can delegate all you want to. Ultimately, I'm holding you responsible. Well. I didn't know they were teaching that to my child in, in the school. You should have known. It's your child. You delegate that responsibility. That's okay to delegate that responsibility. It's still your responsibility to raise the child. It's your responsibility to be the head of the church, I mean of the family. Uh, in the Navy, um, I served under great commanding officers. One, the one in Masawa, Japan, was a guy named uh, Captain James McFarland. And my commanding officer down at uh, the Philippines was a man by the name of Isaiah Cole. And they were two of the smartest men I've ever met. I'd follow them anywhere. During the four years in the Navy that I served, I never once worried about whether the chow hall had enough hamburger patties or whether the water bill had been paid or whether, you know, I, I didn't have to worry. That wasn't my responsibility. That's what they were supposed to do, and they did it well. I mean, when you do your job well, your wife doesn't have to worry about whether the bills are getting paid. But if they keep turning the electricity off and the water off and sending you late notices, yes, she's going to worry because you're not taking care of your responsibility. Likewise, how many of y'all worried last month if the baptistry water before you baptized was warm enough? Well, you didn't think about it, did you? That's because it's not your responsibility. It's mine. And I take care of that. And husbands, you take care of your responsibility. It takes a huge weight off your wife's shoulders. You know what's going to be done? It's taken care of. Well, what do I have to worry about? He's taken care of it. Unfortunately, there are some women that are worrying themselves sick over things their husbands should be taken care of. And see, here's the key. Here's the key. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he, Jesus, is the Savior of the body. In the church, Christ is the key. He's the Savior of the body. As in most families, the father, the husband, is the key. If daddy's not in love with Jesus, if daddy doesn't want to come to church, if daddy doesn't read the Bible, if daddy doesn't pray, most of the time the family's going to fall away. Not all the time, but the great majority of the time. But, but, if you get daddy sold out to Jesus, if you get daddy in love with the Lord, praying over his wife, man, you got something there. And I'm not saying it's 100% all the time, never... But I'm telling you, 90% of the time, those kids are going to fall in the footsteps of day. And if daddy's got it, the rest of the family's going to get it. Statistics have proved it. I'm going to read you this. This is in the Garden of Eden. And, and I'll close because Brother Park's standing over with his watch going, it's time. So this is a very familiar story in the Garden of Eden, and, and I'm not done. I'm going to keep on going next week, okay? So y'all got to come back and bring your friends and your children. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Of course, that was the devil, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. 
But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. She was not quoting Scripture correctly. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not die. For God doth know in the day you eat thereof that your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. That's Adam, by the way. The eyes of both of them were open, they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of the Lord, walk, Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? He said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he, God said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded that thou should not eat? The man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. The Lord God said to the woman, What is this thou hast done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So Eve is having a conversation with the devil about the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. During this conversation, where was Adam? Did you, did you get it? Hold on. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. He was with her. He said nothing. He never said, no, Eve, don't listen to this goomer. He's a liar. No, Eve, God didn't say that. This is what he said. But he stood there and did nothing. That's what a lot of husbands are doing. Not bad. You're just not a spiritual leader. If you were the captain of the ship, we'd be running into boats all over the place. He did nothing. So next question. Who did God call on when he came to the garden? Adam. Now, do you think God was smart enough to know what took place? Don't you know he knew that it was Eve that reached up and grabbed that fruit and handed it over to Adam, and Adam took a big bite of it too? But who did he call? Adam. Adam. You're responsible, Adam. Now some would say, Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake. And the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> but ultimately, God will one day hold us responsible. We cannot do anything about yesterday, but the mistakes that we've made. And it's not suddenly going home and going, what? Brother Sam said, I'm the commander. You're a seaman recruit. Swatty. Cook. <laughs> Don't do that, guys. Please. But there's a way you earn their respect by loving them. Like Jesus loves the church. By showing them, I would die for you. I would, I would give myself for you. Like Jesus gave himself for the church. Nobody will ever love you like I love you. Not selfishly, but selflessly. I will give myself for this family. That's the true leader that God's looking for. Amen today.